Hello, good morning, everybody. This is Roger Royce. Welcome to this week's presentation by the Cancer Patient Lab. As you know, we're a group of, uh, I guess you'd call it uh, patients uh, that are very interested in going beyond standard of care and exploring what's out there in terms of cancer treatment. So this week we have a speaker that's going to take us in maybe a little bit different direction, but talk about something that's very important and of interest to all of us. We have El Musella. He's the president of the Musella Foundation for Brain Tumor Research and Information. El is going to talk to us about the Promising Pathway Bill. It's a promising new legislation that could transform the FDA's drug approval process uh, which, as I think everybody here has experienced uh, some frustration with the FDA and, and, and getting drugs and <clears throat> getting the treatment as well as, as the cost. So, Al, I want to thank you for being here and welcome you. And, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, first, a little bit of, a bit of background because this is like a really strange concept. And at first, you're going to say, you're crazy, you can't do that. But I want to let you know the background of why I'm doing this so that you understand the process. And you have to basically pay attention when we get to the part about the bill and see that all the little nuances come together to create something that's really, really impressive. I'll just let me interrupt to say quickly that there are two disclaimers we typically do, which is one is this is for information purposes only and it's not medical advice. And the second is everything that will be said will be made public. So if you don't want to be exposed, your name, whatever, don't say anything, and and hide your hide your name in the in the uh, in the Zoom. Sorry about that. Thanks. Okay. This was I was a podiatrist in private practice, doing very well, very happy. Then in 1992, my sister-in-law Lana was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. She had four little kids at the time. It was just so sad. Uh, this is her MRI pretty soon afterwards. She had a part of the tumor removed, but this is all tumor. This All the stuff in here is all tumor. So it doesn't look good. This is like one of the most horrible diseases a person could have because aside from all the normal cancer stuff, it affects your brain and your actual person, your personality, everything else. Anyway, her doctors at Sloan Kettering told her there's absolutely nothing else to try. This is a few months after she was diagnosed. They actually said to her, you're not going to make it till Christmas. Just make plans. Um, and at the time, there was no internet resources because the internet was basically uh, discovered that year. <laughs> that was the year that Netscape came out. So when you called the National Cancer Institute and asked for a list of clinical trials, they only had a small list of trials that they sponsored. They didn't know anything about investigator-sponsored trials or drug company-sponsored trials. And they didn't have the technology to even fax it or email it to you. They had to, you had to wait for the mail, and it would take like three weeks. It was useless. Um, and then uh, after I started the foundation in 1998, my dad was diagnosed in 1999. Uh, he didn't do too well. Actually, going back to my sister, I'm sorry, I forgot. We found a clinical trial that would take her that Sloan Kettering didn't know about, and it was just like three miles away. Um, and I found an off-label drug that had a little study and a publication, and we used that on her. And she actually lived eight and a half years after being told it was over in the beginning. Um, strangely, her insurance ran out. Uh, it had its lifetime maximum of a million dollars, and she stopped taking the drug about five years after starting it. And then she had a recurrence, and then she died soon thereafter. So I blame the insurance company basically for her death. If she was still on the drug, it might have kept her going. Uh, my dad, he was diagnosed the same month that Timozolomite uh, Tim came out. Back then, to show you how different life was back in the 1990s, his insurance had a $500 per year maximum on drugs. How far would that go today? <laughs> uh, when he went to the drugstore to get it, there was like a $1,500 co-payment. He had the money, but he didn't want to leave his wife penniless. So he refused to take it. Um, me and my sister got together, we bought it. I just told him we got free samples of it. Otherwise he wouldn't take it. It didn't really help and he died a few months later. Uh, but I also blamed the insurance for delaying him starting the Timidar, which is why I actually started the co-payment assistance program uh, years later. I'll get to that later. 
So a brief history of me, and the only reason I'm telling you all this stuff is not to gloat, but um, so you understand that I'm not just a crackpot saying, let's try this new thing. I have experience in this. I started the first online support group back on CompuServe, and I created the first online database of clinical trials. With our support group, the first thing I did is I got all the members together, and we did a survey of every hospital in the United States to see what treatments they were doing, because there was no master list at that point. So I created that master list. I put the, I made the first online database of clinical trials. The National Institute of Health came to me and they modeled clinicaltrials.gov off of me. My big contribution to that was to tell them to write a law that said everybody doing cl clinical trials or human research had to report to clinicaltrials.gov what they were doing. And that revolutionized the whole thing. So it made it where everybody had a list of all the clinical trials going on. I did the first online registry of brain tumor uh, uh, the first online registry of brain tumors. We collected the treatments that people are doing and the outcomes. That was the brain tumor virtual trial. I created one of the first brain tumor websites. And I had the first video library for brain tumor information. Um, I was the first and only brain tumor organization uh, to offer co-payment assistance to Medicare patients. Medicare is funny. You can't just give money to them to help pay for drugs. That's why coupons don't work on Medicare patients usually. Um, there's a kickback rules. So I had to get special permission from the United States government to do this. And I did it in a certain way. And we've given out over $12.5 million to patients to help pay for drugs so far. I created the first brain tumor collaboration, which was the Great Ribbon Crusade, and it turned into the National Walk Down Brain Tumors. That fell apart because of friction between like the large groups and the small groups. Right now, I'm in a, three other, four other collaborations. They're doing relatively good, but there's still a lot of friction between larger and smaller groups. I did a lot of advocacy for numerous brain tumor related bills, such as the Right to Try and now the Promising Pathway Act. I helped navigate over 25,000 brain tumor patients. So I go through this with a lot of people every single day. And I'm starting to see that most of the, there's a few people who do well, but so many people are dying and suffering. It's the suffering that gets me. I just can't take any more. And I have, I think I know of a better way to approach this. I think it's time to try it because. Over the last 30 years, we really made no no difference at all. We delayed it a little bit, but it's still a horrible, horrible disease. Um, I also published numerous peer-reviewed articles on brain tumors, and I wrote the Brain Tumor Guide for the Newly Diagnosed. I'm just putting the finishing touches on a new book about low-grade brain tumors. I was involved in the FDA Medicare approvals for most of the brain tumor treatments we have right now. I was a patient advocate for numerous drug and device companies for FDA and Medicare meetings. I'm on the advisory board of the UCLA Brain Tumor Sport Program, the Brain Tumor Center at Duke, and Northwell Health's Brain Tumor Program. So I'm not just like this crazy person. Let's keep that in mind. So first, can early access really help patients? Uh, this kid, uh, and I got permission from his parents to use the picture in the name. He was diagnosed with a DMG uh, about well, in May 2018. Uh, he tried two different clinical trials, radiation and standard treatment. There's no standard treatment for this, but he tried the standard treatment for glioblastomas, which is temozolomide. Uh, and he failed everything. He was doing really miserably. He was in a downward spiral. He was bedridden. Um, he had vision problems. He had trouble talking. He had weakness in half of his body, severe nausea, and he was, in general, not, not really good. The family came to me for help. And I suggested, and they wanted to do like one last ditch effort to try something, anything. And I suggested the drug Onctor-1. I was familiar with Onctor-1 because I gave these researchers their first drug, uh, their first grant to get the drug started. Um, in general, to get big grants to run, to get drugs through this pipeline, you need early data to show some proof that it's worth something. And what my organization does is we give those early grants to things that sound different and wild that theoretically have a small chance of working, but it gets them enough data to get the bigger government grants so that they could bring it through the pipeline. So I know these people. Uh, at the time, it was a small company. I think there's only three employees at the time. And they said they couldn't do an expanded access program because they didn't have the resources. They didn't have the people. Uh, they couldn't even answer the phones or answer email because they were just overwhelmed. <clears throat> um, so I asked them if I could start up. I told them a lot of people want this drug. 
They can't get into the clinical trials because it was very narrow entry criteria and there's very few geographical locations. So I said, we need to get an expanded access program started. And I said, I'll help you run it and I'll help fund it. And they agreed. I, we gave them uh, $750,000 to get it started. And this kid, so I told him about this drug. We sent him to MD Anderson to get into the clinical trial. MD Anderson said he's too far gone. Uh, too much progressing too fast. Nothing's going to help this kid. There's no treatment for him. Not even to bother any kind of treatment. Go home on hospice and just die and that's it. And strangely, they charged him $50,000 for that one day visit and MRI. He didn't have insurance at the time. Um, so they paid 50000 which I felt terrible about. So they wanted to get on expanded access. And we were just starting up the expanded access program at that time. He was actually, I think, the second person to ever get into the expanded access program. So we got him the drug. And right from the beginning, he started feeling better. Um, he's been using it every day since then. It's been five years. I just heard from the family last week. It was a five-year mark on the drug. And this kid is back in school. He's riding a bicycle. He's playing uh, soccer. And he's a happy, normal kid right now. It made a huge difference in this kid's life. Um, in our experience, it helps about half the people a little bit and about a third of the people a lot. Not as much as him. He's the most, uh, he's our best person, but uh, a lot of, about a third of people go on for a much longer time, at least two or three times uh, what would be expected. And some of them are still going strong too. Um, the trouble with this, so it sounds like expanded access worked perfectly. The trouble is about 200 people contacted me asking for the drug who I couldn't get them on to expanded access. It still had uh, regulation, it had still had requirements. And they also were not allowed to do combinations in the expanded access program. And it, it ran out after 133 patients. Um, so now the only way to get this drug, well, we, we went to the FDA, there was an ODAC meeting where the drug company presented all the data on the drug. I presented our experiences with it. And we asked for permission to apply for accelerated approval. And they said, no, they want a randomized trial to prove that this actually works. There were shown many cases where those responses on MRIs and kids who were doing good. I brought uh, two kids with me who were doing very, very good at the time on it. And they testified also, I testified. The FDA said, no, we want a randomized trial. And the problem is no drug has ever been shown to help this disease. So there's nothing to randomize it against. So they decided to use a actual sugar pill placebo. So right now the clinical trial is two thirds of the people get the drug and one third of the people get a sugar pill placebo which is like horrendous to me. I, I couldn't imagine being a parent putting their kid into a trial where they might get a sugar pill to treat a disease like this when you know there's a drug that works. Published reports say this more than doubles average survival. So there's no reason that the FDA can't just give this an emergency approval right now, but they just won't. They don't understand our needs. It's like very, very upsetting. So then, it worked in this one case, but there were so many hundreds of other people who wanted access and just couldn't get it. Expanded access is not meant for a large number of people to get access. It's small individuals. That's very high, very select group of individuals because people who have uh, like bad insurance or no money, they'll go to a Medicaid doctor and they don't have the time. It takes a doctor probably 12 hours of paperwork to do an expanded access program like this. And they can't get paid for it. So just think how many doctors are going to waste that much time on a patient when they're not getting paid for it. It's just not practical. So we need a solution where any patient who wants these drugs can get access to them. Then there's the issue of cost. Under the standard pathway, a drug for DIPG has to cost at a minimum 600000 per patient per year just to repay the cost of the development, not including the cost of the actual treatment itself. Under the Promising Pathway Act, we could cut that down to these numbers, and the drug could be like 60000 per patient per year. And if you keep in mind that we're thinking it's going to be a three or four drug combination, so you have to quadruple these numbers. So under the standard pathway, you're talking about $2.5 million treatment per year per patient. That's really not practical. Um, it gets way too expensive, where it's possible under the, um, under the Promising Pathway. And... 
the important thing is I know of so many different drug candidates in preclinical research that can't make the jump into human trials because they can't think of raising money like this. Under the Promising Pathway Act, they can. As a matter of fact, we would get a few of the nonprofits together and get three or four new drugs into the pipeline every year, try them in a phase one trial, and of the ones that are best, we'll put them through this pathway, and we'll get a few drugs every year going into our pathway where eventually we're going to hit a home run. But you can't do that under the normal pathway because it's just too expensive. So the other alternatives are the right to try and expanded access. I thought right to try was going to be the big one. And I spent so much time and energy on this. And we got it passed, but it didn't work. In brain tumors, probably a handful of people ever got a treatment of the right to try. The biggest problem is cost. Insurance can't pay for it. And the drug, uh, and nobody's going to give it for free. So like there's an experimental vaccine available on the right to try right now. I think only like three to five people got it so far but it was really expensive. Uh, their initial estimates were about $30,000 per month, which was like insane for uh, most normal people. Only the rich people could get it. And it makes it look bad that only rich people could get these uh, treatments. And also drug companies were a little bit afraid to go outside of the FDA, thinking that the FDA would uh, hold that against them. Everybody's afraid of the FDA, which is really not right either. Um, and then expanded access, there's still too many restrictions. It takes too much time from the doctor. Not enough people are getting access to these drugs. And it's just not a, a solution for a large number of patients. It's, it's good for a select few people, but still there's a problem of price where drug companies are allowed to charge their actual cost, but very few would actually do it. They wind up giving it for free because they don't want that situation of making it look bad of only rich people getting access. And they also don't want the government to know how much it costs, because if they're going to charge, they have to go through an audit with the FDA um, to see exactly how much the drug costs. And then once they get approval, how do you explain that a drug that costs $10,000 and now $100,000? Um, so these two pathways, although they do help, they were not enough. The, the average patient is not going to get a drug from this. And it's also not going to increase the number of drugs available to uh, patients. Accelerated approval was a great start too. Uh, this is a modification of standard approval where you use a surrogate endpoint instead of a clinical endpoint. So instead of overall survival, you would use like progression-free survival. But that broke down recently with the Avastin trials for glioblastoma. With uh, Avastin and a glioblastoma, it actually makes the MRI look great even the next day because it uh, tightens up the blood-brain barrier a little bit, and it doesn't let the uh, gadolidium get through, so it makes the MRIs look much better. So one of the endpoints, one of the uh, surrogate endpoints was um, response. And so like 100% of patients had a response, so it looked fantastic. Then the second one was progression-free survival. Um, because it makes the MRIs look good, it hid the progression. So even though people were progression progressing, their MRIs still look good. So it made the progression-free survival look good, even though it wasn't helping. But then the overall survival did not change at all. So the FDA looks at this and they say, well, you had a major increase in progression-free survival, but no change in overall survival, which means progression-free survival has no impact on overall survival. They said they don't really like this as an endpoint. So they didn't like progression-free survival, and they didn't like response rate, which doesn't leave that much. So brain to have a problem with accelerated approval. I don't know how it is with all these other cancers, but for brain tumors, it's not good. Um, we asked for accelerated approval for ONC201, as I said, and they rejected it. Accelerated approval drugs have to be good enough on their own to get approval. Like ONC201 is the best drug we have for these diseases, but by itself, it might not hit the standard of um, being good enough to get approved. It actually does double overall survival. And they're thinking that that might not be good enough for some reason. I have no idea. Um, but we know that combinations of it will be much better. And you can't do the combinations under accelerated approval or right to try. Well, under right to try, you can. It's just a matter of money. But under expanded access, you can't. Usually there's a protocol in place that says you can only do exactly whatever the protocol says. That brings us to the Promising Pathway Act. Uh, 
it was introduced into Congress. Um, we have bipartisan support with all these different senators. But there was some uh, pushback on it. So we went back to the drawing board and we modified it. And we came out with Promising Pathway Act 2.0, which is going to be uh, introduced into Congress in the next week or two. Congress has been real busy with other stuff, which is why it's taking so much time. But I hate I hate all the delays that we get on things like this and all the time it takes, but that's how life is. So here's the feature of the Promise and Pathway Act. It applies only to serious or life-threatening diseases. So obviously the current pathways for like a blood pressure drug are fine. You wanna make sure something is very, very safe and effective before you approve a drug that 10 million people are gonna take for a disease where if that drug wasn't available, there's many other options. We're talking about diseases where there are no other options. It's time limited provisional approval for up to eight years. And an FDA advisory committee determines if approval can be converted to a full approval. So you're actually gonna get two chances. You could ask for a uh, FDA advisory committee meeting at any time to present the data that shows that it's good enough. Or at the end of the eight years, there's an automatic meeting where the FDA advisory committee looks at all the data and says whether you can get full approval or not. If you don't get full approval, you lose your conditional approval and you have to go back to the original pathway. And at that meeting, the level of uh, proof is the same as under the standard pathway. So it has to be good enough to stand on its own. Or if you have enough proof of a combination that works, you can get the combination approved. Like this gives us the time, those eight years to work on these combinations so that hopefully we'll get enough data that shows something works. To get into this pathway, a drug must demonstrate substantial evidence of safety and early evidence of a positive therapeutic outcome. What that means is it has to go through at least a phase one trial in pediatrics and in adults really a phase two trial. There's a little bit lower bar in pediatrics. Um, and early evidence of a positive therapeutic outcome could be a biomarker, like if it's an EGFR inhibitor, if it lowers EGFR, that's a good enough positive therapeutic outcome. It doesn't have to be like overall survival at this point, because you don't have the time to get to that much proof. And it'll just be enough to get into the uh, promise, into the conditional approval pathway. The way I look at it is, if a drug is deemed good enough to go into a phase three trial, it's good enough to go into the conditional approval pathway. So the level of risk is the same as if you go into a phase three trial. Actually, it's less of risk because you don't have the risk of getting a placebo. Promising Pathway Act removes all placebos. It's just a different way of doing the research. Instead of a phase three trial where you take a select group of people and have, be very rigid in how they're treated, you take any patient who, who's willing to take it, and it's optional. You have to be willing to take this. You don't, you're not forced to take this. And we see how it does in every single patient. We get a much, much more evidence on how effective the drug is. Because not only are you checking what drugs they're taking, uh, what, what the uh, experimental drug is, you're also tracking all the other treatments that they're taking. And you're looking at the combinations. In general, in a phase three trial, um, first of all, in my opinion, it's impossible to run a valid phase three trial in the United States right now. Perfect example is that October one trial. Um, there's a, there's a uh, counterfeit version of October one floating around. It's being made in Germany. Probably about 200 families in the United States are using this illegal drug from Germany. And most of those kids who are taking it are also in a different phase three clinical trial where they don't know that the kids are taking on 201. So you have these clinical trials where people are taking a pretty effective drug and not telling their doctors. It destroys all the other clinical trials. It, it's like crazy. Um, and there's many cases, I would say, the vast majority of people in a phase three trial are taking something in addition to the trial drug. Like they might be taking CBD oil or doing some other supplements or some other off-label treatments and not telling their doctors. And these other treatments might have more of an effect than the trial drug. So I, I think it's better to look at a large number of patients, find out all the treatments they're doing and analyze it instead of the charade really of a regular phase three trial. The last two phase three trials that actually there was only two or three successful, three, there was three successful phase three trials in brain tumors. Um, all three of them, nobody believed the outcomes. 
it makes it, it was like insane. They all got picked apart completely to the point where they were useless. Um, one of them, there was this dye called gliolin. It was used in Europe for like 25,000 patients. It's the standard of care all over Europe and Asia. But the FDA refused to give an approval. They said, one of my friends actually was developing this drug. Uh, the FDA said they want one more phase three randomized trial before they would give approval in the United States, even though it was 100% completely safe and it showed a remarkable effect and it was used in 25,000 other patients. So they ran this big phase three trial, took them about five years and something like $30 million. And when we get to the FDA meeting where they're going for FDA approval, they picked apart the trial and say they don't like the way that it was blinded. <laughs> it was so stupid. Uh, they just picked apart the design and they already, they approved the design in the beginning, which makes no sense, right? You would think once they approved the design, how could they pick apart the design? They didn't like the way it was blinded. They said, uh, the way it was blinded, half the patients got the dye. This is a dye that you use during surgery and lights up the tumor. So the surgeon knows where tumor is. So you get a more complete resection. The way they blinded it is before the surgery, uh, they would get a piece of paper that said either, yes, you use the drug or no, you don't use the drug. So the ones who use the drug, they got the dye, they were able to use the special light in surgery and remove most of the tumor. And there was a lot larger, uh, there was a much bigger number of people who had complete removals of the tumor in that group. The people who didn't get the dye just went on to the normal surgeries. The FDA said, no, that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is everybody gets the dye. And then at the time the surgeon thinks he's done under the normal surgery, he gets a slip of paper saying yes or no, whether he could turn on the light that makes the tumor glow, which, which is like crazy. Um, of course, they're saying it induces bias because the surgeon knows whether they're able to use a dye or not before the surgery. They could plan things differently or do things differently. So they basically said it was a completely invalid trial. However, based on all the other research that's already been done in Europe and all these other places, we're going to give you approval anyway. So the bottom line was they wasted five years and all those millions of dollars when they should have really gotten approval right at the beginning. Then Optune comes along. Optune is one of my favorite treatments. Um, this is these electrodes that are on top of the skull. Uh, and people said they didn't like that. Uh, there was It was a randomized trial where Half the people use the device, half the people didn't use the device. They said the device should have had a mock control where you have to wear these arrays, but it doesn't turn on the uh, the energy. And it's a very big hassle to use. It makes no sense at all to make people undergo this. And they were using overall survival as the endpoint anyway. So you don't have a placebo effect with overall survival. And if you did, it wouldn't matter because if the placebo effect was that big, I would want it anyway. <laughs> Um, so they disregarded most of that trial and half the doctors in the country still don't use it because of that. Um, and the other one is uh, DCVAX. It's a vaccine. It did great in clinical trials. The best results uh, for recurrent glioblastoma than anything we've ever seen. Um, but there was a few problems with the trial, such as they changed the... Uh, they changed the trial around so that there was a crossover because patients really wanted a crossover. So the, the end point was overall survival. And if you do a crossover where the people who progress go onto the drug, now you're comparing people who use the drug against people who use the drug, which makes it hard to analyze. They also um, found that patients who used the drug and had a good response to it got pseudo progression. The, the scans looked worse because the vaccine was working. So it made it look like the progression-free survival was shorter, even though it wasn't. These people lived a long time. It just made the MRIs look bad. So they removed the progression-free survival endpoint. And people are criticizing and say, once you change the endpoints, you have to change the trial around. Um, and they used an external control group instead of a randomized control group because of that crossover. So it got criticized so much. I don't think half the doctors in the country believe it right now anyway. So if you're not going to trust these phase three trials that are so expensive and you're not going to use their information, why bother with them? There's a better way where we could study it. And I think the data, the data you get in a virtual trial like this is not as theoretically clean as data you get in a clinical trial. 
But if you're using 10 times as many patients, I think that sort of evens out. And you could get better data from a large group of people with knowing all the information rather than a small select group of patients who are not even similar to the uh, target population anyway. Um, in the United States, the average survival for glioblastoma is only eight months. But in clinical trials, the, the control group's average survival is about 16 months. So just getting into the clinical trial, you would say, on a control group, doubles your survival. But that's not really true. What's happening is the such selected patients that they're in a better prognosis group, and they don't represent the average patient in the country. So these phase three trials that they're running are useless. We, this is a much better way. Um, let me move on. I think we're running low on time. So there's some opposition to it. One of the biggest things they say is this will lower the FDA approval standard, exposing patients to unsafe and ineffective treatments. These people don't understand. It's basically the same approval standard. Once they get full approval, it's the same standards. The difference is, instead of doing a phase three trial, you're letting anybody participate in this virtual trial. So it's basically just a different way of doing the phase three trial. Um, they say phase three trials are the gold standard. And as I just explained why there's so many problems, so I'm not even gonna mention this. And how can we tell if a treatment works without a randomized trial? This graph on the left, although it's hard to read, you can't see the numbers. That's the, the last six large clinical trials for newly diagnosed glioblastoma. This is the control group. And basically you could see all these treatments are exactly the same. All these patients exactly did the same. So you know what a patient is gonna be what a patient's going to do with glioblastoma if the treatment doesn't work. This is actually the standard treatment. These are the people who take the standard treatment. That's how bad it looks. Um, I mentioned DCVAX. This is a offshoot of DCVAX. This is DCVAX plus a checkpoint inhibitor. And they did it two different ways. Even the worst way is tremendously improved over this. The best way, you're talking about a major difference. Like, if you, all you have to do is look at the shape of the curve. If you could convert a curve like this into a curve like this, I would try it no matter what the statistics said. I mean, statistically, this is going to wind up looking good. Um, but I don't need the phase three trial to confirm that this is working. If I saw a graph like this, I would take this drug. Wouldn't you? <laughs> um, so they say you're just lowering standards. We want better drugs, not worse drugs. It's just the opposite. This will allow us to get many new drugs into the pipeline and we'll get much more data on each drug on how to use it and we'll get to see how the combinations work which you don't see on the regular pathways so i think we'll see much better drugs and much better combinations than you can now so expect the results we expect a few brain tumor drugs to get approved quickly after the act is approved and a few more each year um, we have a patient navigation program that has been creating combinations of these drugs and we just couldn't get access to them but it's the perfect learning system to use to figure out which combinations are best. And the doctors will finally be able to use their brains and think up these combinations instead of just going through this little checklist of saying, well, first you do a clinical trial. If you can't do a clinical trial, you do A, B, and C. And they never vary from this, especially at the major centers. Um, we also think that the drug prices will eventually drop or at least remain stable as you get much more competition. Um, and the cost of development plummets. Without the PPA, the new drugs are gonna to have to skyrocket in price to the point where we're not gonna be able to afford those. Um, there was just a drug approved now recently that was like $4 million a dose. That's insane. I think we'll dramatically speed up the search for the cure and the amount of research on each drug will dramatically increase. Um, from the point of view of a new patient, um, like if a new patient comes to us and they would say, well, what do you think would be the best treatment? I know that there's like three or four treatments that I would want to take if it was me. And we went through this on a different webinar. But the trouble is you can't get access to it. Like we want a vaccine. And right now, it's really hard to get a vaccine, especially the, the, the better vaccines. Uh, there's a few vaccines out there that already showed at least doubling survival and long-term survivors that went from, like in general, they say, the five-year survival rate is about 5%. Each of these different vaccines had like a 20 to 25% increase uh, of five-year survival. You combine a few of those, and I think we would be able to have a shot. Um, 
when the current system, we just can't get access to it. And it, it's so terrible. We tell people to get into clinical trials. My two or three favorite clinical trials, I would say I would send 20 patients to the trial and we're lucky if one of them gets in. It's so hard to get into the best trials right now. And let alone that it's hard geographically, like the best trial might be in Los Angeles. People aren't going to be able to travel from New York to Los Angeles for a clinical trial. It's just not fair. We need these drugs approved now so we can just get easy access to them. So summary, think of it this way. Uh, this will give you and your doctor the option of using these conditionally approved drugs. The data will be available and intelligent evidence-based decisions can be made. Under the current system, you don't get details about how a treatment is doing. You never get it. They might publish some research on a select group of patients, but you'll never get published results on the typical patient. Um, Oops, let me go back. Uh, so if there's not enough proof of benefit or safety, the drug just won't be used. Just because they're available doesn't mean anybody's going to use these things. Your doctor has to be willing to try these. And in the beginning, when there's very little evidence, it might be tough. Although you always get people who are in a difficult, difficult situation willing to try anything. They'll try it first. And then when the first few people do well on it, then other people will start using it. And for the first time in history, we'll know how a treatment performs in the real world as every patient is tracked in a learning system. That's one of the keys. That's what we need to speed up uh, the pace on this research. We need to know how every person is doing. Every doctor in the country, well, not every, but many doctors in the country try different combinations once they uh, get rid of the standards. But nobody's tracking it. So that if they happen to come upon something that's working, nobody benefits from it. And worse, if they find a combination that definitely doesn't work, they never publish it, nobody knows about it, and other doctors keep repeating the same mistake over and over and over. I think we need to track every single patient in the system so we don't make those mistakes. And it's possible that a bad treatment gets conditionally approved. That's happened in the past even with full approval process. However, because we're tracking these people in the learning system, we'll, we'll eliminate those quickly. No more patients would be harmed than if the phase three trial was done instead. Uh, there's some alternative treatments out there that have been being used for over 30 years. We have no idea how well they work and people keep falling for this. It's very expensive treatments. We think that they're worse than the standard of care, if that's possible. Um, but because nobody's tracking it, we can't say 100% that it's not working. We know it's not working because if it was working, we would have a lot of survivors and there's only like two or three long-term survivors from this. But those two or three long-term survivors are all over the internet getting new people into this. And we're not even sure if it's true because there's no transparency. With this, there's transparency and we see how every patient does. So insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's what we've been doing. And I wanna change the system so that uh, in my lifetime, we see a cure. Um, that's it, any questions? Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Al. Um, yeah, I got a couple questions and I see some in the chat as well, but um, briefly, you know, what I've kind of found, uh, and I think a lot of us have found, is just a lot of resistance from the, the doctors themselves. Uh, and we know the FDA is a problem. We know the insurance company is a huge problem. But oddly enough, once you get past all those hurdles, then you got to find a doctor that's willing to take the risk. Um, does this legislation provide any sort of uh, incentive there uh, for that to happen? Um, well, yeah, one of the incentives is the patient has to consent to it and release the, li uh, the liability of the doctor and the drug company. So the biggest worry most doctors have is if I try a new drug like this and it doesn't work, the family's going to sue me. So they don't have to worry about that. Um, that's really the big one. Okay. Is there enough profit in these things? You know, is there enough money in this to make it worthwhile for a medical institution to take this on? Because believe it or not, I've heard that from some doctors. That's the biggest problem we have because a lot of these doctors make all their money on phase three trials. It's very expensive to run a phase three trial. Like uh, I was just talking to a drug company today. They pay $1 million per patient to a hospital for a clinical a phase three clinical trial. That's going to be replaced by an office visit. So now you'll get an office visit where you just prescribe the drug. So that's going to be a major problem. Uh, I don't really care about these doctors uh, who do this, but that's where our biggest opposition is coming from. Yeah, I'll bet. Okay. But, so yeah, but people win and people lose. It's like 
I care about the patient in this particular case. I don't care about these rich facilities. Yeah. But there's, there's some people will win because they could uh, now develop drugs, more drugs. And like if we're going to have four or five drug combinations, there'll be four or five different companies involved who are going to make a profit. Mm -hmm. So that'll be that'll be the cheerleaders, I guess, to, to get this done. Okay, well, we no, no, we're the cheerleaders because we patient. want to the patient. <laughs> the patients are the cheerleaders. Right. You know, the system was not designed to be a moneymaker for a hospital. That's that should be like the least important thing. Yeah. We'll make the money on the other cancers that are treatable. Now wait till I say you don't need radiation anymore. <laughs> radiation oncologist is gonna kill me. Okay, thank you. We got a couple of questions in the chat here. Uh here's one. Does this mean that there are no or very few exclusionary criteria? That is, are the drug companies required to allow most all patients? Well, right now, if you get the conditional approval under the Promising Pathway Act, um, any doctor could approve it. I, I'm sorry, any doctor could prescribe it for the indication that it was approved for. Like, we're not, they're not really going to allow off label use of these drugs, but. Um, any doctor could use it, like if it's a proof of glioblastoma, anybody with a glioblastoma can get that drug. There's no exclusionary criteria. Any patient well, can get it. It would only well, so, be like the contraindications for whatever the treatment is. Those people well, will be able to get it. Well, well, it's a complicated question because, you know, clinical trials are really carefully designed, as you already pointed out, to exclude people in a way that hopefully will make your trial results better. So are they going to be able to say things like people who've been pretreated, uh, with four other things or people who are, you know, resistant to this, or are they basically going to say in a very broad category, if you have GBM, then you are eligible for the drug? Or are they going to say, are they going to slice and slice and slice the categories into very narrow no. criteria so that basically it's exclusionary criteria? No, if you have a glioblastoma, you could get the drug. However, the way I envision this, and it hasn't been hammered out exactly yet, the drug company is going to be allowed to uh, propose a few, um, I would call them like, uh, I forget the exact term, it's like a data plan where for the end point of getting full approval, they'll say, we only want to count patients who would meet these criteria and we'll put those uh, like everybody could use a drug, but we'll only watch those patients for the purpose of getting the full approval. Like we won't take patients who are on their deathbed and take the drug they'll, as the last they effort. Oh, we'll that's brilliant. They'll they'll pre-identify cohorts that they want to use as endpoints up front so that effectively they're creating virtual clinical trial endpoints. But the goal is that almost everybody, I mean, look, if you're if you don't have a certain mutation and it's a drug to hit a certain mutation, you want to exclude those patients, of course. Well, the they doctor really wouldn't prescribe have the disease. It. The doctor wouldn't prescribe it. That's where the you know the checkpoint the check is. The doctor has to prescribe it. He has to think that it's going to help. Well, but it's a much more complicated question than that, because you could say, you know, what about a patient who you know doesn't have a certain level of of a uh, immune marker in the cell and the patient says, I want to try it anyway. And they find a doctor who'll do it. The drug company could in theory say, we want to exclude those patients and biologically it's a necessity. But the question is, can the drug company exclude on the basis of sort of, these are the things I feel like we should exclude as opposed to these are very scientifically driven exclusions. The drug company would have no say on which individual patients get it. But what they do have is a say on who would be counted in that cohort. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Really interesting. Brilliant. Great idea. Yeah. Okay. Amit has his hand up. Go ahead. Hey, um, Al, thanks. Uh, kind of an interesting topic, especially for some of us who are <laughs> trying to do some of these uh, off, off the road treatments right now. A um, couple of questions. Um, what really helps bring down the the cost 10x me. You showed the standard pathway versus um, the promising um, yeah. uh, pathway. We, I didn't quite get a sense of how. Right, bas the yeah, basically, up. we're going to get rid of the phase three trials, we'll minimize them. They can still run phase three trials, but mm -hmm. it's not going to be required. So, usually, a phase one trial is tiny, phase two is like small, and a phase three is very large. They're the most yeah. expensive ones. By getting rid of the phase three trial, 
you're going to cut out the most amount of time and you're going to cut out the most amount of money. Also, you're not going to have to do multiple phase two trials. It's just like one relatively small phase two trial. And okay. then you get approval and you can start making money. Okay. So how many how many drugs have gone through this so far? And is this focused primarily on um, brain cancer or it is kind of open to all other type of cancers and has it been tried or successfully um, for, let's say, prostate cancer or something else? Okay. Um, it's not a law yet. It's a proposed law. Mm -hmm. um, they're just going to introduce it into Congress probably next week or the week after. And then it, it takes like however long to actually get into a law. It's not just brain cancer. I forget the exact wording used in the bill, but it's a serious disease with no effective treatment. So the, the main ones that we were concentrating on is ALS. That's what the bill was originally written for, it was ALS. Brain tumors, prostate, I don't know, prostate, I'm sorry, uh, ovarian, pancreatic. Uh, in prostate, I would think it would be possible for a specific circumstance like um, Maybe prostate patients who failed, whatever, um, not just like a general prostate, because like right. for most prostate cancer patients, they do very well. It's only right. a small percentage of you that have major problems. So if you could identify that subgroup that has the problems, you could probably argue for getting a drug approved for that. Mm -hmm. And the, the label would say, what, would you have any idea what that would be? So pink, it would be prostate cancer patients who what? What group would do bad? Yeah. yeah. So is there a list of organizations uh, that are actually supporting? Um... Yes. We have a group of 100 organizations that are supporting it. Um, let me see if I can put that in the chat room. Actually, Vanessa, can you put that in the chat? You know where it is? I'll, I'll go find it and put it in the chat. It's on my activism page. Um, unfortunately, the two biggest brain tumor organizations don't support it. Um. We're trying. We're working on them. They just don't agree with me. They they don't think it's a good idea, but these hundred other organizations do. It's just a different way of thinking about it. It's like scientifically correct way is to do it the tried and true method that we've been doing for all these years. If we have another hundred years to wait to get the cure, but we don't have time. I want to see this in my lifetime. You know, um, I think we can make a major difference within months after getting this approved. So so many... Okay. No, no, go, go ahead. Okay. There's a few treatments that we want right now, like even Michael's been trying to get, like Cervaxim, and he can't get it. And a few of these other drugs that he just can't get. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if you click on that link, the one pager, it lists the 102 organizations that are endorsing it so far. Um, so I'll ask the question Brad has in the chat, which is, you know, what can we do to support this? Okay. Um, I'll tell Brad when it's time. As soon as they reintroduce it, which is going to be next in the next couple of weeks, um, we just have to contact all our senators and representatives. I have an easy way to email them. You go to our website and you just put in your name, address, a couple of clicks, and you send it to your Congress people. It's very important. I, I learned that this is really, really important. It's probably more important than even donating money. We had a meeting with, uh, well, actually, Vanessa's husband had a meeting with Bernie Sanders. And he basically said he's not opposed to it, but nobody has really asked him to support this. He said if he gets support, if he gets people in his district asking for him to support it, he will. So we just need patience. We just need people to contact their representatives and just push this. These people, these congressmen get like two or 400 bills a year. And they don't know any of this. They don't know the details on something like this. The only, what they do is they look at who's getting the most push and they look at those bills in detail. They won't even look at something like this unless they're represented, unless their people tell them they want it. And I'll chime in just for a second. Like this bill only applies to a small population of people. I mean, it's a large population, but relatively uh, we're a small constituency group. And so we need everybody in our constituency group, everybody that are facing these terrible diseases to call their call their senators and call their reps. And I think, Al, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have a lot of support in the Senate. So I think we're 
trying to really rally support in the house now. Yeah, it can't hurt. Once you're getting support in the house, it's just, you know, the same checkbox to do senators. Might as well do the senators. Of course, even though they say something now, you got to keep this on their mind so that they know how important it is. Um, so is there any um, any kind of linkage to, you know, Biden's cancer moonshot program that, you know, um, part of that or can get some, um, you know, can that be a catalyst for this? It's funny. Um, one of the collaborations I'm in is part of the cancer moonshot. And they're asking uh, Opera H for a huge grant to implement a brain tumor learning system, which is basically our patient navigation program. So they're partnering with us to do our patient navigation program on a much larger scale and get a lot more support from programmers and artificial intelligence. And they're going to do that through a large Upper H grant. So if they could get this learning system going, that's part of the Promising Pathway Act, they'll be a big part of that. And that would be part of the moonshot deal. Um, unfortunately, I was not invited to the meeting. Hopefully, I'll be invited to the next one. Um, but Promising Pathway Act just didn't come up to that. I'm sure the president would love something like this. Okay. Thank you. Can you drop that link into the chat <clears throat> for the uh, letter to Congress? I'll, I'll drop it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay Ellen can, Morris. Yeah, you, you can actually do it now. And it's the old version. Uh, but you might have to do it again in two weeks when the new bill comes out with a different number. So I would say oh. wait wait until I'll tell uh, Brad or he'll send out a message to the members. members. I like the idea of mentioning the cancer moonshot. That might be another way to get the attention, at least of some of the Democratic reps and senators. And it's bipartisan. We, it's like split 50-50 of our support of Democrats and Republicans. The first time we tried, time we tried it, was, it was all Republicans. Now we finally got Democrats on our side. Good. Alan, you have a question? Right. Anybody Probably else? You. Yeah. Ellen, you're on mute, and you're on the phone. Anybody else is, have any questions? Is is the database going to be publicly available? I mean, de-identified. We're, but... we're talking about this now. Theoretically, right now, any doctor or researcher can access it. Patients can access their own data that's uh, not de-identified. So it's identified. So they'll have um, like all their history, all the different treatments they did. We're also going to ask them to fill out surveys of like uh, patient reported outcomes and to verify what we have. Well, let me step back one. I'm associated with a company called Excures that powers our, uh, you guys know Excures, mm -hmm. but they, they could uh, take your basic information like name, address, phone number, birthday, and get all your medical records and organize them within like 15 minutes right now for most people. Um, that'll be the backbone of this registry. So the patients will have access to that data. They'll be able to verify that everything's true and correct and to add their patient reported outcomes. And they'll have that all in one place, which is really nice because uh, all these people go to all these different providers and everything's disjointed. Here, you'll be able to have one thing. You can print out a quick report to show your doctor and say, yeah, this is my highlights instead of having to remember everything. I think it would be immensely helpful if you would allow not just doctors, but you know, maybe some nonprofits or even um, you know, biostatisticians, professors, a oh, yeah. wide variety of people to access de-identified data because there yeah. would be a gold mine of, of potentially useful semi-anecdotal information. Yeah. Um it's not researchers, so that's covered under researchers. And in my mind, the ex the system that we have for patient navigation. It's a learning system that we have where you could see patients like us, uh, how they did, what treatments they did, and the outcomes. Um, if this system is used for all the different drugs, like for brain cancer at least, um, I'm picturing that we'll have like the majority of brain cancer patients in here. You might have like 10,000 patients a year. You'll be able to mine that data for so many different things. Would a drug company be able to say, in order to take our drug that's in the PPA Act, you need to do a SED rate, you know, once a month? That's a requirement of taking the drug so that they can populate the database? No, they could suggest it. 
but that that's uh, that's not. There's no way right now to require that type of stuff. But they would have all the normal blood tests, like all the blood test results would come in here. All the test results will come in. All the MRI results will come in. The one that were being taken in the ordinary course, but not necessarily course, right. the ones they right. want exactly. taken. Yeah. But if for some reason they needed a certain thing, like they, the SED rate or PSA or whatever, um, they could make it known. Like maybe a good idea would be to have like a newsletter going out to all the interested parties where people could talk about these types of things and say, you know, for all patients who have this, this, and this, we need to do these type of tests regularly. Yeah, that would be very valuable if you could sort of get certain desired data promoted so that people would really use it. It would it could make a difference. In, well, let me in tell you analysis. one example. One example of how we use the database already. Uh, we just published a peer-reviewed paper on the use of Prilosec in brain tumor patients. Like every brain tumor, mm -hmm. most brain tumor patients get um, steroids that cause stomach problems, so they give Prilosec to prevent stomach problems. So we looked at the patients in the database who took Prilosec versus the ones who didn't take Prilosec, and it had a bigger difference than Timodar, which is our normal drug. Hmm. Taking Prilosec decreases your chances of living. Is that wild? Decreases your chances decreases, of living? Decreases. Decreases. If you take Prilosec, it decreases your chance of living. Uh, wow. Can you, do you have a link to that paper, Vanessa? <laughs> I'll find it and drop it in the chat. It's <laughs> wild, but you could look at associations like that. Uh, what happened is one of the doctors saw this on his patients and he wrote an abstract about it and he asked us to see if we could go through our database and prove it and they used like propensity score matching to set up you know the comparisons and they said the difference in survival was significant wow what so was they, the p-value do you know so I'll give you the paper in a second um but it's such an easy thing because there's alternatives. It was uh, what it was um, proton pump inhibitors, any proton pump inhibitor. So instead of using a proton pump inhibitor, you use an H2 blocker. It works just as well. Yeah. And you're going to live longer. And the data shows that? And, and the data shows that. Wow. There was a report on that in a different type of cancer, too, that backs up what we said, basically. <laughs> and there's a reasoning behind it in the paper. Uh, if, if we find it. <laughs> if not, I'll give it to Brad and he'll pass it around. But it's interesting. We presented that at uh, the Society of Oncology as an abstract, and then we published it in a journal. Okay. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Any other questions? We have a couple from Chris Apple in the chat. Yeah. Oh, okay. Chris, I'll go ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to briefly comment it, comment on it. I'm I'm still an adjunct professor at UCSF in the biostat department, um, and you you just mentioned um, um, case matched or propensity score matched um, analysis for the PPIs. Um, I do think that uh, these case matched analysis could actually be, especially when they are propensity score matched, could be actually they look like a randomized control trial. So you really have. Um, um, very strong evidence uh, that there is an effect. Um, I'm happy to to have an offline discussion with you on that. the The other part, which is actually interesting on the PPIs, is um, we are in our platform that we developed, um, which is a functional tumor cell profiling 3D microtumor platform. Um, we are actually looking at repurposed drugs, and uh, we are seeing impressive uh, results from some of the um, I would like to say repurposed drugs. Um, I haven't seen anything on PPIs yet. I don't think it's in our panel at this point. We are planning to to currently look at a 24 drug panel so that we have a wider catch. And there are some some substances where I'm really concerned it might actually increase the risk um, of uh, survival or may actually nurture tumor growth. And so so I'm very interested in not only is there a benefit for it. Um, I think you you find in the internet everything under the sun. And um, and when a patient di go dives into the internet, they can very easily, through their own confirmation bias, get into the wrong conclusions. And so unless you really test this on the patient's tissue, you have no idea what's going to happen. And it may only be applicable for some patients and not for others. And so 
So really looking at what's the impact of, of repurposed drugs is really important. And, and so would love to have an offline discussion with you. Right. Well, a learning system is a perfect place and to test to the well. offline drugs. Like uh, off-label, yeah. If you're using off-label drugs, you need a large number of patients and you have to be able to track them and have that data available. Like just doing it at your institution, which is a big institution, helps. But imagine doing that nationwide. You know, track every patient who uses that combination. I, I think together with X-Cures, we, we, we may be able to, to do something there um, because the, the, the key is the case match control. We actually, um, I was an executive director at Cadence Pharmaceuticals at some point. We did a health economic analysis on a 110,000 database on a on IV acetaminophen and um, what the impact are on on the on the patient's outcome undergoing hip and knee replacement surgeries. So that was not um, cancer related. But the interesting thing was um, with propensity score ca case matching of 22,000 patients, we were able to show a $500 per patient cost savings. And even though this was bundled into the anesthesia reimbursement system and therefore not reimbursable, no so PC, no PCT code, we were acquired by Mylancourt for 1.3 billion within four to six months when when I came up with, out with these results. So, um, um, really looking at real world evidence data, but really applying rigorous statistical methods so that we really have a high level of evidence and certainty. That's actually a very very important step okay um so let's just talk offline wait. and uh, just yeah. to wrap up thank you I'm for your... by a show of hands how many people would support the promising pathway act most of them well not jeff i just don't know enough to vote to be honest with you i listen to everything but i i would want to research it further i don't disagree yeah. i don't not support it. I just need the research. Okay. That's it. Thanks for coming. Thank you much. Thank you.